Yeah, I am here because I, could, I was told I couldn't be here. <laughs> yep, I was told because I lived in Montgomery County, I mean in Frederick County, right. that this was a Carroll County operation and I couldn't, I couldn't be, be here. And then Paula Valley squared things away and he says, I don't pay attention to that. <laughs> so anyway, it's, uh, uh, I'm, I'm Bob Johnson. I'm a retired Montgomery County school teacher after 31 years and uh, got into video from the, from the standpoint of doing transfers. And I, I, I ran a, a movie picture and slide transfer business for over 20 years and uh, enabled me to have some interesting contacts and learn, learn a little bit about video. And then when Paul came on board in 89, I think it was February, uh, I got exposed to the form formalities of it all. And uh, he was an excellent teacher, having just come out of college like he did from Iowa State. The public interest in, in uh, public access came on rather slowly, as I recall, and it was uh, not only sparse, but uh, intermittent. There was, there was people that came out of the woodwork, so to speak, and they indicated an interest in doing their own thing because that's what the PSAs said. Uh, you, you can put your own programs on there and they want. I mean, we saw programs for every conceivable thing. Of course, there was the aerobics and there was the horse shows and there was the, the um, 4-H fair, which George handled for the most part. And uh, we did the, the stuff down at Oregon Ridge. There was a lot of interest in the beginning and it was all volunteer. There was only two people, two pay, paid people, uh, Paul and, uh, and uh, Doris, I think it was. And um, so it was, it was a volunteer personnel throughout. And one of the conditions of having your program, having, putting a program on was that you had to come in and play tapes of everybody else. And this was uh, an opportunity for a lot of the people to familiarize themselves with what else was on the channel. And uh, yes, you got tired of seeing some of the same things when you were on in the evening because the, the replays were done until seven o'clock, I think. And we saw a lot of aerobics. <laughs> but uh, Paul, Paul LaValle, in all of his infinite wisdom, said, you may not like what he did, but he put programs on the channel. And at, when we started out, that's what we were after. Probably uh, programs to give an indication of, this is public access. Um, public access is, was different in a variety of places. Uh, in 97, I think it was, Sally and I went to a, uh, an, an RV rally out in, in Des Moines. So we took the opportunity to go up to Ames and see the public access channel up there. A lot different than down here. And a lot of, a lot of times it was inf informal, more informal. So I got a chance, we got a chance to see some of that and uh, gave us kind of an impetus on maybe where we should go or what, what we should do. It was in the basement of a, of a building on the college campus. It, and I remember it was big stone walls, heavy stone walls. And the, the girl that ran it was the head, head guru there. And then they moved from, from there. That was channel 50. And that was 88. And they moved from there when Paul came to 117 East Main Street in the old bank building. And 
they uh, set up the, the studio and edit, edit, editing room with a big window that overlooked into the studio so you could see what was going on. And we had everything, everything in there. The program, they, they came in and they painted a mural right there, live on camera. And people were flinging paint brushes full of paint. And, and it was an interesting sort of thing. I was, I'm trying to think of who that was. The, the first venue was in the basement room in the, in the college building. Then we came to 117 East Main Street. And that's when this young guy, Paul Lavalley, came fresh out of school, but he had, he had experience. It's like four years, I think it was. And uh, we saw some of his, his uh, 16 millimeter and eight millimeter movies that he shot for courses that he had taken uh, on campus. The bank, the bank was an interesting venue. The simple reason it was in the old hotel and it's alleged to have been a brothel at one time, but it was in the, in the old hotel. In order, in order to get places in the building, you had to go upstairs or downstairs, and you had to go in the elevator downstairs. And sometimes we found ourselves, by necessity, having to go to the restroom, which was upstairs. And when you went up the back stairs, it triggered the alarm. And next thing you know, the police came and wanted to know what we were doing in that building. <laughs> so it was, a, it was an a, a, a opportunity to adapt. I did quite a bit of stuff for Mount Airy, when they, especially for the 94 centennial. And uh, we, Mary, Mayor Jerry Johnson, uh, and Delane Hobbs, and these older people. And we got a chance to meet some of the, the people. The oldest lady that was there was, she was, in fact, the video that I, I took, I made of the early days of, of Mount Airy. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of her name. But she was 102 that night that we staged the play and all. So I got a chance to see those, those community members. And then we, uh, we taped uh, town council meetings with uh, the town council and the mayor and Delane. 26 weeks, we did your county commissioners and your county government. And that was a, a real exposure to being a grip because we had those two huge chests of lights from the Fresnel lens ones on stand and then we had, we, we called them coffins. Okay. And so we would pack those in the truck, the last thing, put them across the back. But we had three cameras, three tripods, three dollies, we had uh, a big monitor and a, uh, a pair of scopes. It was interesting because this was, this was the time in which nobody lorded over anybody. We all went in there, Tom and Sally and myself, Tom Forsyth, and Sally Malik and myself, we were the, the basic team. We loaded the truck and drove over there and loaded it. And it was, we met at 2.30 met at, at 117 Main Street, took all the stuff down in the elevator, loaded it in the truck, drove the truck over there, and uh, set it all up in room seven down in the basement. And uh, who was it? I think it was... Maggie, Maggie McPherson, one day she came in and there was a microwave in the next room. So she brought a bag of popcorn. Well, it's pretty hard to wor wa work with the smell of popcorn going around and you didn't have some. But we set the, we set the stage up and uh, 
Usually there was just somebody. Uh, they had cue, cue cards so that Mickey knew exactly what was coming up next. And Maggie McPherson was, was the key to the whole thing. I was very impressed by the people that she had on your county government. Um, the simple reason is that she brought all of the various departments, heads and personnel up there. And as a cameraman, uh, you got to see all of this. And she would uh, identify them and ask them poignant questions as to uh, what we're doing and their position in the county government, etc. And I was quite impressed of the quality of the people in the county government that she had on the program. But it was 15 minutes every Thursday for 26 weeks. Yes, it was, it was a bit of a chore, but we, Tom and Sally and I also all looked at it as an opportunity to learn because we each got to learn how to set up the scopes, set up three lights per person, mic everybody, and then watch how it was done. So we are exposed to a variety of training sessions. It's essentially, if you want to look at it that way. And uh, one day we set up the equipment and we had a three quarter, all the equipment was three quarter U-matic. The camera, the deck, the playback unit was all three quarter U-matic. The three quarters was a, a long lived uh, format. It went on and on. It lived forever almost. And when it got tired here, they shipped it to Central America. I can remember some of that, but uh, I had plugged the output of the, the, the video switcher into the input. I mean, instead of putting it into the input of the record deck, I plugged it into the output. So there was nothing recorded. And we went to play it back. And I had goofed, really goofed. And Mickey picked up on that and she filled in and she just ran as though nothing was happening. But uh, then she said, well, we don't have a guest here. So you, she took me and interviewed me, and that's, that's on that d DVD. She was a, 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 real, a real person that fulfilled her job. And I guess she was in the information and uh, personnel department somehow. Mm. But uh, she was uh, always courteous, always thoughtful, and ate popcorn too, so. Tom, Tom uh, Crown, Tom, Tom, Tom Crown and, and uh, Deirdre, his wife, and the, he, on the, for his side business, he, he built himself as Tom Crown and the missus. And we went, uh, one day we went out to the airport and he made the airplane disappear. And we did a show for the, uh, the fair up in Juniana County at, uh, not State College, but the other town up there. And he made a truck disappear right on stage. Now, obviously, it didn't disappear. It was, it was manu manipulated, but um, I don't know what's happened to Tom. He's, he's not around anymore. Greg Whitehair and, and, uh, and uh, Bernie were employees at Social Security down there on Security Boulevard. And they got interested in it, and they, they produced a number of programs, very, very avant-garde in those days. Well, Greg Whitehair d developed a per persona called Underwear Man. And we had a meeting in the main hallway at 117 there, and he brought a pair of, of uh, shorts for everybody to wear, and we wore them on our head and peeked through the holes. <laughs> and uh, he was, he still is something, something. He, he a lot of, lot of interesting ideas. 
he did a number of little vignettes. The one I liked the most was he had a, a large console television set and he was doing something with it and it was on the street and it started running down the hill and here was, here was uh, Greg running after it. It had a rope on it, but he couldn't get to the rope. And next thing you know, it ran off camera and finally <laughs> he had some interesting ideas. He had a, a, a shtick that he did, a three-legged card table. And this one of the most amusing things I ever saw. And there was talent, obviously talent, that he would do this. And he would, first one leg would collapse on him, and then he'd put that up, and then another leg would collapse on him. And it was one of these uh, Abbott and Costello routines, if you want to think of it that way. We did, of course, an awful lot of the shows at, at the uh, auditorium in Westminster High School from up in the balcony and went up in the ceiling where you could, where the spotlight shone down and put a, put a camera up there. Well, now these were not little cameras like the ones nowadays are just a pound and a half. It was one of those big 23-pound, three-chip JVC cameras. But it was an opportunity for people to uh, develop expertise. I think probably it was the opportunity to learn. And we did, we did learn a lot. What I did for an extensive amount of work for the, the town of Mount Airy and uh, the history, because it was the 94 cent, uh, centennial. And that was, that was interesting. But I, I learned a lot, and I think that probably was the major accomplishment was I got an exposure to real live video using three chip cameras. But it, to me, if I did it and got it done and um, satisfied me, the, the, doing the stuff on the history of Mount Airy was interesting because I lived in Mount Airy, and to me that was my hometown. It, 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 the, the old buildings, on, on Main Street, it's kind of like the, the resurrection of downtown Sykesville. Well, they, they, in a way, resurrected Mount Airy. And of course, Mount Airy was a bedroom community for uh, the various towns, Montgomery County and Damascus and Baltimore and Frederick. Uh, I enjoyed doing it. I enjoyed doing the programs. And, Yes, I, I, I did good work, and I prided myself in the good work I did. And some people said, they would see a program, and they said, I knew that it was you who made that, because that was a Bob Johnson shot one after the other. The uh, um, scenic, scen scener the scenic areas. We did, uh, Sally and I did a whole week on the J. Millard Taw's Clam and Crab Bake, which is only, was only one day, but we, we went down there for the, the uh, crab truck decorating contest, and um, it was 90 plus degrees that whole week, and she carried the deck, I carried the camera, I think she probably carried the tripod, it's, and those old, heavy old tripods. But we enjoyed it, and uh, the program that we produced was uh, um, about essentially the history of Crisfield, mm -hmm. because we were able to get the Crisfield Times to let us use a pic pictures from their library. And uh, that was a new area to us, so we kind of reveled in that. But it was hot that, that week. It's interesting that when you get to know some people and they start calling you by first name, you're, you're in. Not that, you, not that you want to flaunt that particular idea, 
or that you want to be in, in the in crowd. But I remember a very poignant situation. We were taping a, a Cal County Commissioner's meeting up in, in the library there. And it was about the time that the machinations were going on with regard to this building. And we had um, Julie Gouge and Donald Dell. So after we were all finished taping this, two, just two people, and then we used, we used two cameras. And uh, we finished taping it, and uh, I asked Don, I said, how's things coming on the, on the new media center? And he said, Bob, you'll get your media center, is you'll get the building. And I think you look back at all this building and this huge studio and all, the, all that went through the planning. And yes, they cut unnecessarily, cut budget because the, next to the wall over here was supposed to be the garage where the vehicles were in. But we got offices and editing suites and we got equipment. And that, that all came to be because people were interested in it. And um, we did have one producer that was very, very into art. And Joe Israelson was the, uh, was the sculptor. And we worked quite a bit with her in producing a, the story of the reclining goddess, which we finally put up on the hill. And in the program where we flew around um, the town in a helicopter, and we, in a way, paused a little bit or slowed down as we flew over the, the, the sleeping goddess there on the top of the hill. Um, she was an interesting artist, and it was interesting working with her. I didn't particularly like some of the things she did, but that was my preference, not hers. Um, we, um, we had a, lar a long association with, with George Shearer, and George is, is the quintessential producer here for many moons. And if there was something to be set up, like in the basement of 117 Main Street, there was all those other rooms. Well, we had the, the Christmas uh, production there, whatever what was it was. The bending area. Yeah, and, and George would string wires and string cable. All night. Oh, yeah. He was the consummate volunteer, and to this day, I think he still is. If he's still doing the the um, 4-H fair and, and that over at Shibley, over at Shipley Arena. Yeah. Yep, he was, and the, he was a good man, still is, mm -hmm. but learned a lot from him, learned, learned a lot how to operate those scopes. Mm -hmm. um, and I had no idea. I, I, I've used scopes with regard to my business. I had a radio repair business since 1942. And I re re restored antique radios. I still have a shed full of them today, waiting to be fixed. But George was uh, technically competent because of his, his job uh, in the electronics industry with uh, Northrop Grumman, I think it was. Probably there was no I don't know that there was any one mm -hmm. highlight that shone above all the rest. It was a group of people producing programs of their interest, which is what public access was all about. It uh, helped me and a lot of other people. I had some programs that I, uh, that I wanted to do, which I have only done of, of recent. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm still working on a on a production about the early transportation history of Frederick County, in which I, I've gone through, I've gone and uh, videoed and documented essentially all of the bridges in Frederick County. 
And it's, it was fascinating. My brother-in-law, who essentially did the same thing in the state of New York, he was a New York highway engineer, and this gave him access to it, uh, to it all. And uh, so he got me interested in bridges. Well, I started meeting people, I, and I, we went down to the, uh, the stone bridge over the Monocacy, which was the, uh, which had the um, um, jug bridge. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met the lady who had bought the house, which was the old uh, um, toll house. And she was living in the toll house there at the bridge. So I told her what we were doing, and she went inside and got framed pictures of years and years ago that we uh, used those in the, into the production. And this was uh, pictures before the collapse of the bridge in 42, when it uh, fell down, the second arch from the east end collapsed. And uh, then we had the, the, uh, the other stone bridge over the Monocacy. Um, I did the, the production called Big Time with Little Trains. I remember that. And that was the, the Chesapeake and Allegheny Steam Preservation Society's railroad at Leakin Park. Right. Every Sunday from March to November, starting about 2 o'clock, they would get all those trains running. And uh, it interested me. So I was there every Sunday for over two years and had to make sure, in, from the sake of continuity, that I had a blue sky and white puffy clouds in every shot. I wouldn't go there unless I had a blue sky and white puffy clouds. The uh, gentleman that um, ran that uh, helped me out from the standpoint of, of uh, making sure that that uh, I was covering certain things. Um, some of them are gone now. Uh, in fact, one of the editions of the program um, was dedicated to one of the uh, one of the fellows. But they were a group of not necessarily ex railroad people, but people interested in a hobby. Well, I I taped. The big time with little boats, which was up at Lake Redmond. I went up there and spent a day and watched these guys in their little little boats and the contests that they used to have to see if they could manipulate it through it, a series of buoys. And then I did uh, big time with little planes, which was uh, a group of the model railroaders out at the old uh, landfill uh, across behind the uh, animal society out there. There was a, y a young man who w told the story of the history of vacuum cleaners. And he was impassioned about that. He was impassioned about it. And <laughs> you, you watched the program as it was going on, and you realized this is a field that really a lot of people don't know anything about. It, it, would, it interested me from the mechanical standpoint, just like the boats and the planes and the trains, and mechanical. Um, and he, he did a good job. He showed all of the, I mean, the ver various vacuum cleaners that came about. And one thing he mentioned in there that I didn't know was that the tubular Electrolux vacuum cleaners were, were produced mainly in World War II to produce a f an axial flow of air through a tube to ventilate ships, the, the rooms on ships. And then it provided such a great air mover that they, after World War II, they brought them out as Electrolux vacuum cleaners. And the little pieces of information that were brought out um, that's what public access was. And when you tout a channel devoted to people who want to produce their own, their own thing, this exemplified those choices, those producers, those people 
who had an interest. And uh, it wasn't necessarily all mechanical like me. I mean, I, uh, I was a vocational teacher in the automotive field for those 31 years. Loved it. It was, it was great. And to this day, I don't fix anything. I have my oil changed by Jiffy Lube, <laughs> but uh, I've gotten out of that because, mostly because I can't slide under a car anymore. But I have uh, other people that I've taught who uh, tell me how much they enjoy my program and what they learned. And, and my son uh, went through the program and he, he now is a, an engineer for NIST. And he's in charge of the machine shop and service for the reactor they have down there. So he's, he's come, come a long way, loves his job. I looked upon Pat as my guru, and um, I, I could search him out if I needed answers to things, because he always, for me, was the answer man for problems about video. And in the early days when you, you, didn't, you didn't know, well, leave room for scroll, the, the rolling thirds down underneath, or do this or do that, um, he was the answer man. And the, I was, it was good to work with him. My biggest joy was going down to the National Archives. And I went down there for over two years to the uh, film library there in College Park. And I transferred films, practically every film, from the Ford Library at the uh, National Archives and I made 23 two-hour productions of Ford cars. And the, the production, well, F Frederick County has the complete collection and there's a, uh, a museum that I've supplied with, uh, with uh, that. And, but this was interesting to me. I didn't like Ford cars. I was a Chevrolet man. And when I got back from the Korean War, I became a Studebaker man. And then shortly thereafter, I became a Saab man. I had seven Saabs in my yard, various years, from three-cylinder to V4s. I, and this, this, is, uh, was, uh, this was enjoyable to me, because that's what I taught. So, yes, I enjoyed, I've enjoyed it and made a a lot of friends and learned a lot from being involved with public access in Carroll County. Dick Sch Schlechter said to me one day, he said, I don't know whether you know it or not, but you were my inspiration for getting into video. Well, I mean, I, I felt f somewhat flattered, but I, I didn't think it was true. <laughs> well, I mean, I'll be 83 next month. And so you realize that, that in each life there's a beginning and an end. And I treasure the fact that I've had an opportunity to work with Carroll County and the, and the uh, public access channel and develop an expertise and meet a lot of friends and fellow producers. It's, uh, it's really not only invigorating but rewarding.